On average, there are 250 babies born every minute. That means more than 130 million in a year. A human's first two basic instincts are survival and reproduction. However, infertility affects roughly 12% of people of reproductive age in the United States, or about 7.3 million women and their partners. Um, overall, the uh, prevalence of infertility, so the um, percentage of people with infertility in the United States is thought to be between 10 to 15 percent, and that prevalence has been considered pretty normal or pretty static for a while. Um, what is changing, which is not directly infertility but related, is the age of first pregnancy in women is starting to go up a little bit. Blocked fallopian tubes are a common cause of infertility. Every month during ovulation, the fallopian tubes carry an egg from an ovary to the uterus. If an egg is fertilized by sperm, it moves through the tube to the uterus for implantation. If both tubes are fully blocked, pregnancy without the treatment called in vitro fertilization, or shortly IVF, would be impossible. Um, the basic goal of IVF in anyone who's trying to help someone get pregnant are to get the egg from the female side and the sperm from the male side to come together and fertilize. What IVF is specifically different with is that the egg comes out of the body and the sperm comes out of the body and the fertilization happens in a dish in the lab and then the, now the embryo is replaced back in as a pregnancy. It started with Dr. Bob Edwards, a young Cambridge physiologist in the UK who had been creating turmoil in his home country for daring to suggest that patients with blocked fallopian tubes could be helped to conceive children if their babies were conceived in a petri dish. After the success of in vitro fertilization in mice, he became increasingly obsessed with the notion that in vitro fertilization could be applied to humans. But development of the technology would need a supply of human oocytes. In 1965, Edwards came to Johns Hopkins in Baltimore as a visiting researcher for a year since Hopkins agreed to supply him enough human oocytes for research. In 1968, Edwards began to collaborate with Patrick Steptoe, a senior British gynecologist. Steptoe was the national pioneer of laparoscopy, a minimally invasive technique that Edwards needed for harvesting oocytes from patients. Leslie and John Brown had been unable to conceive for nine years. Leslie had blocked fallopian tubes. Using a laparoscope, Dr. Steptoe took an egg from Leslie's ovary. Dr. Edwards mixed Leslie's egg with John's sperm. Then he placed it into a special solution to nurture the fertilized egg. After two and a half days, they placed the fertilized egg back into Leslie's uterus. In 1978, Louise Brown, the world's first baby ever created by in vitro fertilization, was born. It had taken nearly 10 years of experimentation before this first success. It was a triumph in the history of reproductive medicine that an infertile couple was able to have a child of their own. In the United States, Dr. Howard Jones, a gynecological surgeon, and his wife, Dr. Georgiana Jones, an endocrinologist, both doctors at Johns Hopkins, decided to join the newly created Eastern Virginia Medical School in Norfolk in 1978. Dr. Jones was the doctor who provided Dr. Edwards with oocytes for research while Edwards was a visiting fellow at Johns Hopkins. In 1980, Judith Carr came to Dr. Jones's clinic. She had a history of three ectopic pregnancies, and both of her fallopian tubes were removed, making it impossible for her to become pregnant. In vitro fertilization was, at that time, illegal in Massachusetts, where she lived. After the in vitro fertilization procedure in Virginia, Judith delivered a healthy baby in December of 1981. Baby Elizabeth was the first successful in vitro fertilization baby in the U.S., for the people with infertility like Leslie Brown and Judith Carr, the development of in vitro fertilization was a true medical triumph. I think it's a triumph for many, many reasons. First of all, just at basis, the egg is a single cell and somebody found a way to take that single cell out of the body, um, take another cell from another human being, fertilize the egg, and um, help an embryo develop that ultimately becomes a baby. Um, it's a triumph in another way too because at the time IVF was considered something that could never be done. 
So um, the people who pioneered IVF were really just working blind and really on faith. And when you talk to some of these people, um, you realize that they did it because they just had this very strong belief that this is something that needed to be done. The news of the first test tube baby in 1978 produced a storm of media coverage. However, it has also raised various ethical, religious, and legal issues. Newspapers and readers made comparisons to Aldous Huxley's 1934 novel, Brave New World, in which natural sexual reproduction is banned and humans are grown in labs. A Nobel Prize winner and a pioneer molecular biologist, James Watson, predicted, all hell will break loose politically and morally all over the world. During her pregnancy, Brown had to be moved from her room in response to a bomb threat. In 1987, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith in Vatican issued a Donum Vitae, the gift of life. Donum Vitae amounts to a detailed consideration of every aspect of in vitro fertilization. It found them illicit on Catholic moral grounds because they are outside the bonds of conjugal love. The 2008 Dignitas Personae also addresses bioethical questions. While recognizing the legitimacy of the desire for a child and voicing understanding for the suffering of infertile couples, the document adds, such a desire, however, should not override the dignity of every human life to the point of absolute supremacy. Another issue is the disposal of unused fertilized embryos. The other issue that we want to look at is what is being done with all of these embryos that are produced, keeping in mind that life begins at conception. Typically, uh, more than one embryo may be implanted in the woman's uterus as there's a greater chance of successful development and birth taking place. In some cases, though, more than one embryo will develop properly, and then the issue becomes, does the woman want to have multiple children or not? And in some cases, the woman will make the unfortunate decision to abort one or more of the embryos that has uh, begun to develop because she's chosen to only have one child. The other issue is that even if those embryos are not implanted, what do we do with these embryos that we call extras? But in many cases, those extra embryos are either frozen or simply discarded. And of course, that's not in keeping with the dignity that each of those human persons, each of those human lives is due. Finally, a legal challenge has emerged. I'm honored to be the lead sponsor of the Life and Conception Act, which simply defines human life as beginning at the moment of conception. One of the intentions is to forbid the use of in vitro fertilization on the grounds that it causes the abortion of fertilized eggs transferred to patients because many fail to produce a live birth. A bill was introduced in the United States House of Representatives in 2013. There are currently 10 states with personhood legislations pending. In the broader culture, in vitro fertilization has won the best thing that a controversial technology can, widespread acceptance. It is estimated that since Louise Brown's birth in 1978, over 8 million babies have been born from in vitro fertilization around the world, especially for people who have no other option but IVF, to be a parent, in vitro fertilization is a medical triumph for sure. In 2010, Robert Edwards won the Nobel Prize in Medicine for his role in pioneering the in vitro fertilization procedure. The Nobel Committee cited achievements that have made it possible to treat infertility, a medical condition affecting a large proportion of humanity. Today, however, in vitro fertilization still has many critics. In 2014, Dr. Howard Jones mentioned in his book, although in vitro fertilization has come a long way since the breakthrough of Louise Brown's birth in the UK and Elizabeth Carr's in the US, they can by no means be considered mature yet. He hoped for more effective, safe, and less expensive procedures. Also, there are important ethical issues, as the Catholic Church addressed, that should not be overlooked. As Dr. Howard Jones mentioned, Higher success of single embryo transfers with more advanced technology in the future could resolve some of the ethical issues. Test tube baby. It was a triumph in medical history, but it's still on its journey to perfection.